Welcome to today's session of the Winter Spring 2024 CFR Academic Webinar Series. I am Maria Casa, Director of the National Program and Outreach Department at CFR. Thank you all for joining us. Today's discussion is on the record and the video and transcript will be ma made available on our website, cfr.org academic, if you would like to share them with your colleagues or classmates. As always, CFR takes no institutional positions on matters of policy. We are delighted to have Moises Naim with us for a discussion on power and authoritarianism. Moises Naim is a distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and an internationally syndicated columnist. Dr. Naim's experience in public service includes his tenure as Venezuela's Minister of Trade and Industry, Director of Venezuela's Central Bank, and Executive Director of the World Bank. He has held appointments as a professor at Yeza, Venezuela's leading business school, and Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Naim is the host and producer of Efecto Naim, an Emmy-winning weekly television program on international affairs that airs throughout the Americas on direct TV. He was the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy magazine for 14 years and is the author of many scholarly articles and more than 10 books on international economics and politics. Welcome, Dr. Naim. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thanks for inviting me. Delighted to be with you. Uh, you have been reflecting on the nature of power, authoritarianism, and autocracy for many years and have written a series of books that focus on these themes. Uh, could we begin with you telling us a little bit about your current thinking on the subject? Of course, uh, I am as concerned as many other people are about the fact that democracy is in retreat and authoritarianism is booming. And this is not just an opinion, uh, this is uh, solid data from Freedom House, it is an institution that uh, uh, analyzes and surveys the world in terms of its propensities towards the freedom or not. And in the most recent report about uh, uh, the state of freedom in the world, they show that it has global freedom has declined for the 18th consecutive year. So for every year, every in the last 18 years, democracy was declining and authoritarian regimes of different stripes and forms uh, were taking over. Uh, political rights and civil liberties were diminished in 52 countries. And the fact is that the majority of the people in the world today uh, live in uh, authoritarian regimes or regimes where the checks and balances that define a democracy are not uh, functioning, fully functioning and are limited and constrained. This is a very complex a surprising world in which uh, uh, a lot is happening for the first time, or a lot that we believe is happening for a first for the first time, in fact, has happened before. I have a, here uh, a phrase, a couple of phrases by uh, European thinkers in the 1930s, uh, after the First World War and uh, before the Second World War. They, they saw it coming. Uh, they did not know exactly what form would it take. But uh, Jose Ortega y Gasset is a famous uh, Spanish thinker of, the, of that time. And in 1930, he, he wrote a, a book. And one of the phrases in the book is, we don't know what is happening to us. And that is exactly what is happening to us, that we don't know what's going on. We know that something big is going on, uh, but we don't know exactly how is it going to affect our jobs, our companies, our, our politics, our life, our society, and so on. Another politician at the same time, an Italian this time, uh, in, in the 1930s, wrote a, a, a book. Antonio Gramsci was his name. He was in jail uh, for uh, political reasons. And uh, Gramsci wrote, the old is dying and the new is yet to be born. In this interregnum, monsters are, are hatched. Uh, I repeat, the old is dying and the new is yet to be born. In this interregnum, monsters are hatched. And uh, we have the same feeling now that first, yes, there is a lot that we don't know. 
uh, and uh, that surprises all the time and happens for the first time. It's, uh, it's almost, I wrote a column recently about uh, the unprecedented planet in which a lot of things were happening for the first time. The typical and most uh, uh, well-known example of this is climate change, right? It's creating all sorts of unprecedented situations and, and, and points of view. Um, I have been tracking the world in this from this perspective, as you said, for a, for a, for a long time, and uh, there are two books of mine, or three books of mine, that I think do not answer all the questions, but do answer most of the important questions of our time. They are they are thirty years in the making. There was one in two thousand and five, another. Uh, 10 years later and another 10 years. The first one is illicit, how smugglers, traffickers, and copycats are hijacking the global economy. And the book showed how that at the time in which everyone was globalizing and going global, it was called very fashionable. Uh, the, the, the group that, you know, that took most advantage early on and were early adopters were criminal cartels. And they were very good at using borders as, as, as ways of leveraging their, their capacities, possibilities, and, and, and goals. So illicit, uh, they, the, the role of illicit, the role of criminalized and governments uh, is something that I'm sure we're going to speak today. But looking at this, uh, what was happening was also that the governments were waging war on all these criminal activities in the trafficking of people, of drugs, of narcotics, of money, of weapons, of even human organs and arts and everything else. And uh, the, 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 the governments were losing this battle. You, you know, they won from skirmishes here and there with the cartels and the criminals, but all in all, they were losing. So that led me to my following book, The End of Power, in which I analyzed. I started with thinking that this is a government thing, only to discover that it was happening everywhere. Not that power was uh, uh, disappearing, but yes, power was more constrained. People that had power had now more limits, more restrictions on how it can use power. And the central theme of that book was that in the 21st century, power has become easier to accept, easier to, to obtain, harder to use, and easier to lose. And that is directly relevant to the, to the subject of authoritarianism that are dis we are discussing here. Ten years later, uh, uh, I wrote a book uh, called The Revenge of Power, which is what were the, those who had power in massive quantities, what they were doing to, to, to limit the erosion of the power and the ways and the, the, the sharing of power, the distribution of power, the sources, the origins, the usages, the possibilities of power at this time. And I came up with uh, the three the, the idea, the, the, the recognizing that what the revenge of power is, is that some authoritarian regimes were using the three Ps to retain government. The three Ps are populism, polarization, and post-truth. The three are very well-known uh, characteristics, but they have acquired uh, unprecedented uh, potency under new circumstances, and they define very quickly what are the, the new breed of uh, authoritarian regime that appear to look like Democrats, but in fact, they are undermining democracy from the inside. We have a long list of leaders that were elected, in some in fair and free elections, others uh, by just uh, stealing the elections. But once they got in government, they started limiting, uh, constraining, and diminishing the, the powers that constrain the power of, of the uh, chief executive. So that is a, is the context of in which we are moving. And one of the themes that I would like to hope to, to chat with you all has to be with the, what I mentioned before, the criminalized nation of the state uh, uh, and, and how this is related to authoritarianism and to globalization. Let me stop here and start the conversation, Maria. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction. Now let's open it up to questions. 
Please click the raised hand icon on your screen to request to ask a question. On an iPad or tablet, click the more button to access the raise hand feature. When you are called on, accept the unmute prompt and state your name and affiliation followed by your question. You may also submit a written question via the Q&A icon or vote for quest other questions you would like to hear answered in your Zoom window at any time. We'll start with a uh, raised hand uh, from Carl Gilmore, an undergraduate student at Stanford University. Carl? Carl, another second, otherwise we could come back to him. Well, let's move on to a written question. Um, it's from Michael Stramiska, professor of world history at SUNY Orange in New York State, uh, who writes, I see a dilemma with the need to restrict communications and mis and disinformation from extremists and authoritarians, uh, though this would seem to mean a restriction of free speech. However, free speech is never an absolute right. What can governments do to prevent authoritarians and extremists from taking power through manipulation of the information and social media sphere? I no longer believe the argument that the solution to hate speech or other such disinformation is more speech because, because with social media, lies and hate can be spread at lightning speed in great mass and force. Well, the question has uh, many good answers embedded in it. Uh, it's uh, hard to disagree with the professor's uh, perspective and, and his caution. And, and, uh, we have been surprised by what's happening in social media and how that uh, has changed a lot in the world of politics and so on. That, we should remember, was driven by technology. It was driven by uh, all sorts of innovations. Uh, I, I think his question is the question for our time. How do we protect the free speech and uh, democracy at, while at the same time limiting the impact of the wrongdoers or the, or the people that are abusing the system or using the system for very nefarious uh, goals? We don't know. Nobody knows. That question is at the core of the great debate of our time. All, I'm, all I want to stress, perhaps in addition, is that expect surprises. And it's very likely that the surprises will come both from the world of politics and from the world of technological innovation. But we don't know what those are. Uh, next, we'll go to Buba Misawa, who is professor of political science at Washington and Jefferson College. Please go ahead, Buba. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, professor, name uh, that was a uh, great um, uh, conversation you started. But let me ask a, a simpler question, uh, uh, and I know between you and Granchi, you can answer us. Um, what is, why are we attracted to this new model or this old model of uh, authoritarianism? Is it because democracy has failed, or why? Another great question at the core of a lot of the debates that are uh, going on. So thank you very much, Professor Misawa. The answer has a lot to do with the underperformance of governments and the, and the you know, broken expectations. Uh, the expectations of people uh, very justifiably grow much faster than the capacity of the states to respond to their needs and hopes and ambitions and, and expectations for a better life. Um, that is happening. That was also always happening. Uh, and, and Sam Huntington, a famous professor, identified it that the gap between expectations and uh, of, of the voters of the people and the capacity of the state to deliver on that that has always existed. But now, for it has been amplified with technology and with the globalization and with uh, all kinds of uh, uh, new ways of doing things and changing the regime. Uh, uh, the the essence of the story is that uh, we will um, have to deal with the non-performance of governments. And what is happening is that we, we need to, I don't think we have to relaunch everything and throw the baby with the bathwater, but the capitalism in the 21st century and uh, 
and a democracy in the 21st century need adjustment. The worlds and assumptions uh, that were on which these were based uh, are no longer with us, and we have not replaced them yet. And that's where Gramsci, uh, you know, is so relevant. You know, in this in, in interregnum, he called it, uh, a lot of very bad things can happen, but also very good things can happen. But the es essence of the story is that expectations are making. Uh, governments are very hard to function uh, and very th there is a need to, to as i said that i'm repeating myself there is a need to adjust um, our capitalism and uh, democracy that uh, we have until now to the new realities and and we all know the, the the long list of new things that are happening that need a response climate change being you know very important in this story Our um, next question is from Bernard Haeckel, professor at Princeton University. Thank you, um, and I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Professor I am a great admirer of your work. Thank you. I have two questions. So one is that you have uh, different petro states, both of which are, are, are authoritarian, but they deliver very different um, goods and services to their population. So take, for example, the UAE or Saudi Arabia on the one hand and Venezuela on the other. So what accounts um, to, uh, for that difference? And the second is that in countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, they tell you, you know, we're a tribal society. If we have democracy, we would have inefficient government. We would have chaos. We would have Islamists who would come to power, uh, as you can see, for example, in Kuwait, where you, they have a parliament. And so therefore, there's an argument that authoritarianism is really the best way to contend with the um, global problems and with providing um, services to their populations. Thank you. Yeah, yes, uh, Professor Hakim, that's, that's absolutely right. And uh, we don't know that there is a respect for authoritarianism that uh, is essentially grounded on, on the performance. And so we, we now give very, a lot of importance to governance and, and to the capacity to govern. And uh, they're doing a good job down there in the, uh, in the Gulf countries, they, they surely, but it, it is so specific, the, the set of circumstances, their origins, their history, the society, the geopolitics, uh, their economy is so specific to them that it's hard to replicate elsewhere. I see, we have not seen it. And then we don't know how resilient these governments are like that without starting in the route of the, the of repression in, uh, you know, the underlying assumption uh, in in this conversation, uh, the elephant in the room, of course, is the capacity of these governments to be repressive. And, and, and then what happens? We, we saw, for example, the admiration for the Chinese model and its capacity to build infrastructure and to build uh, all kinds of things. And uh, it was presented to us as an example to follow. And remember the, the Beijing Olympics that was this perfect display of organization and performance. Uh, but we, as you know, uh, now that China uh, has been entangled in all kinds of problems and all kinds of difficulties. So yes, we need to look at other examples, but remember the context and understand that uh, this is a f picture in a, in a moment, but over time, the sustainability of all these uh, uh, governments is, uh, is going to change. Our next question is a written one from Rodrigo Moura, who is an undergraduate student at the University of Essex. Uh, he asks, you have mentioned the three Ps that authoritarians use to gain and consolidate power and influence. What about money? How do you see the use of economic incentives by authoritarian regimes, mainly abroad, to gain influence? Yes, the, 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 there are two themes there. One is the perform the economic performance of, of a, a nation and a regime, and he, can it provide uh, the prosperity that people uh, need, want, and fight poverty and fight inequality and so on. That that's one dimension on the uh, on the theme of power. The other dimension of the theme of power is the one that, that that's very uh, complicated one that has to do with money in politics. 
and then and how money can replace uh, the will of the voters. And we are seeing that even in democratic societies in which money uh, defines uh, political outcomes uh, with a negligible contribution or participation of the rest of the people. So money has many dimensions, but the two main ones are that money in politics and the necessity to provide uh, for a better life for as many of the people in the country as possible. And those are two challenges that a lot of governments are not meeting. Our next question, let's take our next question from Lindsay McCormack, a graduate student at Baruch College. Lindsay? Thank you, uh, Professor um, Naim. Um, I had a question, uh, a follow-up to your piece in um, El País from it was included in the the background materials for this webinar. You discussed how uh, today's dictators don't really have an out, like maybe a generation ago, that they could, you know, take a lot of money and go somewhere and retire in luxury. Which I thought was a very interesting point. Um, and you suggested that's a reason a reason it can be so difficult to transition away from authoritarian regimes um, that essentially their leaders are trapped in this situation of their own making. And I was wondering if you have uh, any any uh, any idea what to do about that. <laughs> How to, um, it, it's, it wasn't a good situation in the past where you could steal a bunch of money and go to the French Riviera, but um, at least it gave an out um, and, and the possibility of change. Yes, that's a, a, a very thorny issue. Uh, Ms. McCormack in, indicated. As she, as, as, she, as, you, as you mentioned, the, the, the challenge here is what do you do with dictators? Uh, and if, if most of them uh, cannot run the risk of not being in power, because if they are not in power, they are in jail. So government is not just for service or for corruption, but also for protection. And uh, unless uh, you can provide uh, an exit, a uh, ramp out, uh, it's going to be very difficult for these people to go anywhere because no other governments will protect them as, as, as much as their own government and their own, typically their own military. Uh, so um, that is going to be with us for a while. Uh, an international coalition of democracies could do something, but as we know, multilateral work is as um, desirable as, as is often in effective or too, too ineffective in, in fact. But that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, our next question is written is from Alfredo Toro Carnevali, professor of political science at Montclair State University. Uh, he writes, I was perplexed by the speed with which Ecuador, a relatively stable country a few years ago, was overtaken by organized criminal organizations from Mexico and Armenia competing for access to the port in Guayaquil. How could this happen so quickly and so dramatically? What can Ecuador do? Could you comment on this? Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible situation. Ecuador was one of the most stable uh, countries in, in, a, in a tough neighborhood of uh, high political volatility and instability. Uh, and then it fell into the, the, the trap uh, of uh, that so many other countries in, the, in that neighborhood are ha having, which is uh, being um, complacent with the presence of uh, drug cartels and, and, and criminals and, and that have infiltrated the government, that have infiltrated society, that have access uh, to huge quantities of money. And we saw, uh, you know, the globalization of organized crime because a lot of these things, for example, you saw uh, um, a lot of the Mexican cartels operating in El Salvador, in, in Ecuador, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and and that is part of the of the answer. It it it, it, it was all it always existed, but never at the speed and scope it, it, that it exists now. Uh, we'll take our next question from Bjorn Krondorfer, director of the Martin Springer Institute and an endowed professor of religious studies at Northern Arizona University. Bjorn, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I brought my question. It's about the role of religion in authoritarian regimes. We see this with white Christian nationalism in the United States, with Putin's embrace of Russian orthodoxy in Orban's Hungary. I mean, really across the world, different and, and different religious traditions. What is your sense of the religious power or the religious force in relationship to political authoritarian power? 
Thank you for the question, Professor Grondofer. Uh, it's the, the, the magic words in global politics, the politics today, uh, everywhere, is legitimacy, legitimacy, and legitimacy. There is a huge deficit of legitimacy in which governments are not legitimate, uh, either because they acquired power through uh, sham elections or because they had a coup. But the need to have uh, legitimacy, to be respected, to be uh, recognized as a valid uh, the regime is there. And one of the tools for legitimacy is religion, as you well said. Uh, and, and yes, it, it, in the same way that money in politics is a very important uh, thorny issue, um, money in religion uh, to fund uh, and support uh, gov specific government is also a big issue for which we don't have a lot of uh, good answers. But yes, you, your point is excellent. Um, going back to Carl Gilmore, who is a, a student at, at Stanford University, um, he's written in his question, many journalists appear to perish or become confined when confronted with the consequence of publishing truth to the people that expose the abuse of power. What is your recommendation to these beacons of truth when weighing the heavy cost of careers in journalism? Do you foresee that there will be any remedy to this assault on free speech or censorship through fear and violence? Yeah, what, what a problem, right? And uh, we we know that you know there are governments, uh, there are countries that have, uh, uh, have most people, most journalists in jail. Turkey, Mexico uh, are horrible situations in terms of persecution and, and repression of uh, journalists. Um, and I don't have any uh, answer other than admiring, recognizing and honoring uh, the work of these journalists that every day go out in the street, uh, not knowing if they're going to go back at home later in the evening. Uh, it is a, a global uh, situation. We are already seeing how some of these authoritarian regimes are using them, uh, captured uh, journalists are using them as uh, exchange uh, in, in deals. Uh, th there is um, uh, the, uh, a very well-known journalist uh, from the Wall Street Journal that has been incarcerated for uh, unjustly in Russia. Uh, and um, and he is just one of the most visible ones, but for each one of them, there are hundreds that are being repressed everywhere. And uh, trying to generate uh, the most important prescription is to continue to generate visibility and don't let uh, uh, them disappear from, the, from our information ecosystem. Our next question is from an executive in residence at the Yezi Business School, uh, Alex Wallace. Wallace, Alex? Hello, thank you for this, so interesting. Um, I wondered if there are any examples of authoritarian regimes where the populace is actually thriving and or the standard of living is high. I looked at the World Happiness Index and America's pretty far down there. There's probably one or two above it that are not democracies. I just wonder if there's any place where authoritarianism has actually not been bad for the populace. Well, uh, yeah, well, of course, uh, Ms. Wallace, that's, that's uh, very important. What we don't know is for how long and how sustainable, you know, look at the sustainability of these things. And, uh, and it's not clear uh, that uh, they are, you know, in the long run, they will have the same uh, format or the same face. Uh, but but yes, uh, th there are places. Uh, Hungary is an example of places where the economy is doing relatively well, but it needs the support and the sub subsidies. Uh, and uh, and at the same time, there has been some progress. And let's not forget uh, the progress that had been taking place in China, where literally millions, uh, hundreds of millions of people were lifted out of poverty. Uh, and, uh, and and that is a performance that is uh, unrivaled in terms of uh, success. But at the same time, as I mentioned in my answer to another question prior, is that uh, now uh, the, the highly admired system in Russia is beginning to crack. 
We have many, many written questions, but we would love to hear your voices. So please don't be shy and um, click the raise hand icon um, if you would like to ask your um, question um, orally. In the meantime, we'll take a question, uh, a written question from Chip Pitts, who's a lecturer at Stanford University. Uh, he writes, I worked with a number of NGOs concerned about the expansion of unchecked surveillance technologies by governments and companies. Uh, surveillance capitalism. What's your view on the trends uh, regarding surveillance and how excesses can be corrected? They are horrible. The trends uh, uh, regarding surveillance are horrible uh, and becoming more common uh, around the world. Uh, again, China is probably the world champion in terms of uh, surveillance, uh, but it's also in Switzerland you can find it and uh, other European countries. Even in, in the in very well functioning democracies, you you see this uh, this. Uh, Technologies that are being used, uh, and and then you know there is a violation of privacy. There is a, a use of, uh, of to, to repress uh, movements and organizations. And again, um, the only hope we have, I think, is two. What uh, the, one is. Uh, having an uh, acknowledging, understanding, recognizing, keeping in mind that this is happening. Don't forget that this is going on. And the second is that, again, I think the world of technology may give us some positive surprises in terms of how to protect ourselves from uh, this, this excessive, abusive, uh, authoritarian kind of behavior in terms of surveillance. Um, our next raised hand is from Katie Latakanyan, who is Associate Professor at Adelphi University. Katie? Hi, thanks very much. I also wrote my my question in the in the Q&A. Um, I'm interested in what you think an international order premised upon authoritarianism would look like. For most of the post-World War II era, liberalism and liberal concepts, universal human rights, rule of law, sort of defined the operating system of the uh, the operating system of, of international relations. Given what you've said about authoritarianism and the, the internal and domestic focus of it, what would be the elements of the operating system if there's a shift toward authoritarianism as the operating system in international relations? Thanks so much. Mutual protection. Uh, what these uh, countries that are authoritarian and uh, uh, beginning, and we have evidence, they're working together uh, internationally to uh, ensure that they are protected, that they will not have some color revolution or some invasion or some other social political dynamic that puts them at risk. So they, each one of them has a, a, a dense web of international connections with like-minded uh, governments. And, uh, and, and, and we should expect more than that. But always remembering the phrase that says that countries don't have friends, they have uh, uh, interests. And so the interests of these authoritarian governments are converging for now. Uh, but we don't know if there's going to be what's going to happen in, in reality there. Our next question is a written one. It comes from Patrick Duddy, Senior Advisor for Global Affairs at Duke University and former U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela. Uh, he asks, uh, Dr. Naeem, uh, could you cite a recent example of a situation in which the international community or local democracy advocates have been able to roll back authoritarianism and restore democracy? Yes, first let me say hello to Patrick, who is an old friend of mine. Uh, nice to hear from you. Yes, uh, fortunately, we have examples. and I think the most recent example is Guatemala. Guatemala had a government that uh, essentially uh, was voted out of power, but so NGOs and civil society and the media and the private sector and the church, and they all got together in a fantastic way and were able, to, with the support of the United States, by the way, uh, with an important role on the part of the United States, uh, 
but the leadership was uh, in Guatemala, uh, and and Guatemalan democratic politicians that that, that too, ha, were so successful, uh, and so yes, there is uh, hope, and there's always opportunity that a good leader, together with a good organization and the support of the international community, can stop the decline uh, towards uh, the, the autocracy in some and protect democracies. Uh, we'll take our next uh, a question from Andrea Cuervo Prados, who is adjunct instructor at Dickinson State University. Andrea? Hi, uh, Mr. Naim, thank you so much for your insights and knowledge. I also read, uh, wrote my question on the chat, and it is related to Colombia. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts about that country, about Colombia, which right now seems to be moving to an authoritarian regime recalling some of the initial stages, you know very well, Venezuela leave under Chavez tenure. So what's your view on the Colombian case? And do you believe an authoritarian regime is emerging in Colombia? Thank you. Yes, I am worried. And I think there is there are good reasons to be worried about what happens in Colombia. Colombia used to be a solid democracy. Colombia showed the way on how to combat uh, drug tra trafficking, uh, how to reclaim uh, neighborhoods that were untouchable by the, by the police and others because they were controlled by the drug traffickers. So there was a long list uh, that, uh, uh, that made Colombia a, a country worth looking at. But then a, a combination of uh, toxic polarization in which the country, well, like many others, by the way, uh, got uh, entangled in all kinds of highly polarizing debates, behaviors uh, created, weakened the state uh, in in. Colombia. And now they have a president that is uh, surely frustrating the hopes of the people that voted for him. And he is displaying behaviors that are not democratic. Um, and uh, all in, 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 you know, in, in, in the mix of showing and trying to present himself and, uh, and his policies as democracy, but they're not. So, yes, um, but at the same time, perhaps the good news is that the, the, what's remaining of democracy in Colombia, and especially in the legislative branch, can curtail and limit the, the, the advances, the anti-democratic advances that, um, that are, are taking place there. But it's, a, it's a worth watching and crossing fingers. Our next question is from Jose David uh, Baguena, an undergraduate student at Buffalo State University. He asks, how does the rise of authoritarianism in certain countries affect the global balance of power? And what implications does this have for international relations? Yeah, well, the, the central answer there is uh, the hegemony and the nature of hegemony and uh, who has it and how it, it sust sustains it is, this, is a central theme. Um, hegemony and, and, you know, dominate the idea that, for example, the superpowers of the United States will continue to be a hegemon. Uh, I think it's true. It will continue to be the hegemon, probably uh, in, in more than anything in some areas of, uh, the, mili of, of, of the military, uh, of military affairs and military uh, organizations. Uh, but yet uh, the he hegemony will be, um, uh, is, on the, is on the plate uh, to be debated, discussed, uh, and eventually uh, adapted at what are the realities of geopolitics in, in, in these times. Um, let's see, we'll take our next question from Rita Kiki Edozi, who is a professor and associate dean at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Naim. Um, very interesting uh, conversation. Um, so about a year and a half ago, you participated in a debate um, around the same subject. Um, you, um, with Ju Julian Walker, um, and, and your thesis was, of course, the rise of authoritarianism. And Julian's thesis was um, that um, authoritarianism would not um, you know, emerge in the US, um, you know, despite, you know, um, 
your um, thesis about um, sort of Trump's um, authoritarianism. And, th and that's because um, the U.S. had, you know, institutions at, you know, um, the national, um, local and institutional level that sort of um, would mute um, or sort of um, soften uh, the blow of authoritarianism. Assuming both of you are right um, and that, um, you know, both there is authoritarianism on the rise, but so is there a pushback against um, authoritarianism, especially in the US. Um, my question to you is, um, don't you think that um, uh, democratic regimes um, are sort of um, embedded with the contradictions of um, authoritarian thrusts and pulses as well, and that, you know, they go one in hand and um, we ought to, um, you know, um, acknowledge how they sort of coexist uh, together. Thank you. Yes, Professor Edozi. Uh, I, I think the answer to that question will hinge quite a bit on the results of the U.S. Uh, elections uh, this year. I do believe that um, Mr. Don Donald Trump is a threat to democracy in the United States in a variety of ways, because democracy is not just what happens when you go to vote, as you know, but it's what happens in between periods in which the days in which you go to vote, in which you really want the uh, uh, checks and balances to be autonomous, independent, objectives, honest, and uncorruptible, and, and all of that. And uh, that is not what uh, uh, President Trump showed us in his uh, f uh, that time in government, nor what he's saying in, the, in these days. So uh, I, I think whatever the generalization one wants to make uh, at this point uh, has to be centered on the consequences at home and internationally of uh, an electoral win by Donald Trump, if that happens. Our next question is a written one. It's from Harry Meller, political science student at Wheaton College, who writes, I was wondering what your thoughts were, were, were regarding whether the current Russian state reaction to recent terrorist attacks may be employed or used by the Putin regime to push an anti-Islamic authoritarian view similar to the US during 9-11 or in relation to earlier questions, used to bolster the hegem hegemony of Russian orthodoxy? Yes, I think Putin is already doing it. Of course, um, uh, he has mentioned a little bit uh, the Muslim theme, but mostly he's blaming Ukraine and he's using uh, the, the attack to show what uh, that essentially arguing, which is not true, uh, that uh, uh, the attack, uh, the terrorist attack, was uh, you know the, the the doing of the Ukrainians, um, and and again uh, we live in a world in which uh, there are millions of people that don't know uh, who to believe, what to believe, and where uh, to to you know how to think about these issues. And I think this is an example. We'll take our next question from Susan King, dean at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Susan. Hi, um, just to be clarified, I'm Dean Emeritus, so I'm no longer sitting Dean. Um, I I'm, uh, want to ask a question with, that plays off what you've just said um, about the U.S., and you talk about the importance of government. It's been a lot written just recently about the pandemic sort of overhang, um, that there's PD, uh, PSTD, you know, in um, uh, many communities, and that reviewing it, that many felt the ambiguity of the guidance that they got has left people really desirous of more clear answers and some worry that will lead to authoritarianism. Do you see the COVID experience, the pandemic, as sort of a backdrop for the United States elections? I don't know. Uh, that is high expectations, right? Is assuming the government agencies in the United States are infallible and knew what they were doing. And the fact of the matter is that they were doing it for the first time without precedence. They surprised us, the scientists surprised us when they came up with a vaccine in a record time because everybody had been saying, you know, it takes a couple of years or more uh, to, to get a vaccine through the system. Well, the scientists collaborating internationally 
were able to do it. But what I don't, I don't think is that uh, one should expect governments to have that capacity uh, of dealing with a pandemic of the global scale uh, and, and doing everything effectively or doing things at the service of certain ideology or political interests. Uh, I think there are room for mistakes and, and, uh, and ignorance about how to deal with the situation. Uh, and doing as uh, much as possible with the information they had. And the political context, just remember um, the, the, the debates and uh, how difficult they were. And the, the long-term consequences of COVID, of course, there is long-term long COVID is an issue and is becoming an important issue. But uh, there is a new pandemic, which is mental health, mental health as you know, uh, the, the, the global, the, the world uh, has seen an increased uh, level of mental health problems and the United States is significantly there. Our next question is a written one from Alex Beltran, an undergraduate student at University of Houston downtown. I would like to ask you about your thoughts regarding Mexico and its current national issues where there is a president who attempted to eliminate several national agencies, including the ones in charge of elections. In addition, the current president is very clear on letting the corruption of cartels continue. Is Me Mexico on its way to becoming more authoritarian? Considering they have elections soon, it might be early to talk about that, but I would like to hear what, you're un uh, what you understand about the subject. Well, I understand that yes, it's too in a normal democracy. It's too uh, early to be uh, to talk about what's going to happen because you don't know who's going to win. In the case of Mexico, everybody knows now who's going to win because there's going to be uh, an election that is heavily influenced by government intervention in favor of the candidate of the government. Uh, so that's that's one thing, and the government of Mexico, and in particular Lope, President Lopez Obrador, are uh, saying important examples of what I call political necrophilia. Uh, you know, necrophilia is this perversion that some human beings have, you know, that a strong attachment to cadavers, that they like uh, cadavers. Well, there is a, a political manifestation of that, the people that are deeply, deeply attached to uh, uh, bad ideas, ideas that have been tried and tested in the country once and again, in different countries with different circumstances, ideas that always end in more corruption, more inequality, more poverty and so on. And 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 President, if you look at the initiatives of President Lopez Obrador, you will see that there are all kinds of examples of, of political necrophilia in which he's doing things that have been tested in the past and there are clear mistakes to do it again that, that he's uh, undertaking. Our next question comes from Michael C. Davis, Professor of Law and International Affairs at Jindal Global University. Michael? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've just uh, written a book on Hong Kong called Freedom Undone. And one of the things I constantly run into uh, in talking about the book is a criticism, well, it's pointless to talk about Hong Kong uh, China is not going to listen. Uh, and so you're just, uh, it's a waste of our time even to, to host a, an, an event on it. And so the question I have is, does Na is in the cases like this, where uh, very successful authoritarian regimes in, in charge, what's the best response when you're told that sort of naming and shaming really doesn't matter, you're just going to be called anti-China forces, and uh, they're going to ignore it? Well, but the rest of the world is not. The rest of the world will clearly benefit from a group of independent, objective, reliable, trusted analysts, professors, journalists, politicians, policymakers that uh, shed, that you know put the f light on what's going on as you know better than i um this you know in, recently the, the, there was already the decision to pass the law in hong kong that clearly curtailed um any any hopes of 
of uh, more democratic to retain some of the Hong Kong's democratic uh, uh, values and behaviors and institutions. So it's already happened, but I think there is a, a, the, the, the possibility that you find people that understand what's going on and how this is backsliding towards uh, authoritarianism in Hong Kong uh, can be still being formed uh, or used to be to, to inform the uh, rest of the world how to think about China by the way uh, they, uh, to look at how they have dealt with Hong Kong and then the next stage of the conversation as you know will have to do with Taiwan uh, President Xi Jinping constantly repeats that uh, there is no debate there that Taiwan is part of China and it will be become integrated with China. So the, and, and that creates, of course, all kinds of anxieties uh, because of the uh, role of the United States in, in 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 the treaty. There is a mutual protection military treaty between uh, China and the United States, as you know. So uh, no, don't stop it. Don't leave it there. Insist. Our next question is a written one from Hunter Shields, undergraduate student at Davis and Elkins College. Uh, he writes, if social media acts as a significant factor in the spread of authoritarian government models, does it become the responsibility of non-authoritarian governments who may see how such systems can cause chaos to censor or limit the exposure of authoritarian ideals? Would censoring authoritarian governments make the non-authoritarian governments act in the same way as they uh, as they try to maintain the political status quo? Well, I don't know that censoring is anything that I would ever recommend. Uh, but there is no doubt that we need a regulatory system that, uh, for example, to the, to contain uh, the spread of disinformation that is now happening and that is being uh, acted as the as, as the question the question said. You know, there is a lot going on there, uh, and it's important that. Uh, the fight is continuous. The, the, the fight against misinformation, distortion, lies, hate uh, continues. The, 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 we, we will need to find ways to contain that. Our next question is a written one from Wilson Wameyo, who is a graduate student at the uh, Jagiellonian University in Poland. Uh, he asked, how is the new conflict between Russia and the West emboldening authoritarian leaders in Africa and South America? Yeah, that is the fear. And, uh, and that is why so many leaders, so many democratic leaders are saying that uh, the outcome of the war in, in between Russia and Ukraine as a result of Russia's invasion uh, will define the prospects for democracy around the world. If Ukraine falls uh, and, uh, and you know loses the war, and it becomes uh, that uh, province uh, of of uh, Russia, the 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 all 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 bets are off in a variety of ways. I don't think that will happen, but I also don't think that uh, a, a victory of the Ukrainian forces is uh, at this point is on the table. So negotiations will ensue, and, and, and let's hope that through this negotiation, one can preserve uh, the, the, the independence of, of Ukraine and uh, also uh, stimulates the creation of an co international coalition, a uh, pro-democracy coalition that has some tooth and can work on that and so in support of countries that are fighting the good fight in terms of protecting democracies. Our next question is a written one from Azadine Layachi, professor of politics at St. John's University. Uh, you said earlier that we need to adjust capitalism and democracy to the new reality. First, what are some of the specific dimensions of this new reality? Second, what kind of adjustments do you suggest? Well, it's obvious that the economy as it now works is not aligned to the realities of climate change that we're facing. The climate emergency requires action and requires a sound economic uh, thinking and action and policies. 
inequality, inequality around the world has increased in significant ways. And uh, again, the, the, the economy as it now stands, it has a peaceful coexistence with inequality that has to be shattered. And if, you know, the fight against uh, monopolies and concentration of power and all that has to be very effective. Um, the whole regulation of uh, free speech and speech in general and disinformation and all that uh, has to be aligned uh, to democracy and to what we have as a democracy political system. So there is a list of things that can be done, that, but that require political will that is going to be very hard to get. Our next question uh, comes from Mitek Boduzinski, Associate Professor of Politics at Panoma College. Uh, the question is, from a U.S. foreign policy perspective, can the logic of great power competition be reconciled with democracy promotion? It depends how that promotion is done. Remember that uh, under the banner of democracy pro uh, you know, promotion, uh, the, a, a lot of uh, bad governments uh, have been uh, maintained. Uh, I, I understand the question is a good question in terms of uh, uh, how to uh, make it possible for democracy in the United States, for the United States to be effective at democracy pro promotion. I think that is going to be reviewed and it's going to change. And I think the way we have been thinking about foreign aid is going to be uh, adjusted. Our uh, next question is from Diego Abente Brun, Professor of the Practice and Program Director, Latin American and Hemispheric Studies at George Washington University. He asks, why are some authoritarian Latin American leaders popular? AMLO, Bukele, Millet, and so on. How can we restore faith and trust in democracy? Fandom. In my book, The Revenge of Power, I talk about the new quality that has politics. You know, you always wanted a, a politician had to have some sort of uh, attractiveness, uh, the magic, the magnetism that attracts followers. And uh, now is more than that. Now it's a fandom and it has to do with identity politics. It has to do with how do you feel that you belong to a group that uh, is like you and you are like them. And, and all of that has, is having uh, immense political consequences that we have not seen before. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have, maybe we have a, Time for one more question. Um, we'll take it from Rod Biddick, Professor of Political Science at Sam, Houston, at Sam Houston State University in Texas. Democracy is about self-rule and majority voting. Yet populism employs something that can be implies something that, that can be democratic, but can become authoritarian. What can be done to ensure democracy does not result in suicide? Wow. Well. <laughs> uh, but I understand the feeling, no, that uh, democracy will be underperformed, uh, underperforming in some areas that are critical for the people. Uh, and, and, and again, performance and transparency uh, are two important conditions for all of this. Um, tra transparency and, 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 and paying attention and participating. Okay, uh, we have many more questions. We've covered an enormous amount of ground. So I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Naeem, for um, your time with us today, and to all of you for your questions and comments. Uh, the final winter-spring academic webinar will take place on Wednesday, April 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Yan Zhong Huang, Senior Fellow for Global Health at CFR, and Rebecca Katz, Professor and Director of the Center for Global Health Science and Security at Georgetown University, will lead a conversation on global health security and diplomacy. In the meantime, I encourage you to learn about CFR paid internships for students and fellowships for professors at cfr.org slash careers. Follow at CFR underscore academic on X and visit cfr.org foreignaffairs.com and thinkglobalhealth.org for research and analysis on global issues. Again, thank you all for joining us today and we look forward to you turning, tuning in on April 10th.